Hello, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural episode of the Lawyers with Game podcast. I'm Darius Gambino, and with me is my colleague, Angie DeCespedes. And we're really excited in particular for today's episode because the Supreme Court just handed down its decision in the NCAA Austin case. So stick around with us until the end so you can hear us talk about it. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Lawyers with Game. If you're interested in learning more about legal issues in the world of esports and video games, you are in the right place. My name is Darius Gambino, and I am first and foremost a lifelong gamer. I've played on just about every system from ColecoVision to the Sega Genesis to now the PlayStation 5. I'm also an intellectual property attorney with over 20 years experience advising clients on issues related to patents, trademarks, and copyrights. I'm with the law firm of Saul Ewing, Arnstein, and Lair, and you can find me on Twitter at the handle at Philly IP. And with me today is my colleague, Angela DeCespedes. Angie and I are both members of the video gaming and esports group at Saul Ewing. Angie represents uh, clients in the sports and entertainment industry, such as the Miami Dolphins, the Professional uh, Soccer Federation, D. Mayor, and various other clients in high stakes litigation. Angie, welcome. And can you tell us maybe a little bit more about your background? Thanks, Darius. Uh, Like Darius mentioned, my name is Angie DeCespedes, um, and I am beyond excited to be here today launching episode one of Lawyers with Game, mostly because it finally gives us some well-deserved street cred, given what we do for a living. Uh, As many lawyers ourselves included are actually kind of cool, nerdy, but, but but in a cool way, which is fine. I was, you know, listening, you know, to you before, and uh, Atari was also one of my first, you know, loves. And uh, I think the console was released when I was about three years old. I'm dating myself, not that it matters or, or, or that I care, but I spent countless hours playing Space Invaders and Pac-Man. And although much of my time now is spent playing things like FIFA 21 and uh, Grand Theft Auto, you know, because I'm doing research because I'm a lawyer. Um, it, it, it's really hard to explain sometimes to my eight-year-old son, Liam, how far we've come from Atari to, you know, the PS5 system that I have got, you know, sitting behind me. It's, it's really, really unbelievable. Uh, and I've, I've got a theory that, uh, which kind of goes along with our, with the name of our, of our, uh, show lawyers with game that all those hours of playing video games actually made us really really good at, at our jobs uh, you know attention to detail laser focus hand-eye coordination all things that I think we use uh, all the time so this this kind of fits with that getting back to what I do I'm also an attorney at Saul Ewing which is a national firm with offices throughout the US as Darius mentioned I'm a litigation partner based out of Saul's Miami office where I was born and raised Cuban and everything but I've also practiced and I'm licensed in New York. I have 20 years experience as a litigator and a trial attorney, and I defend my corporate clients when they get sued. And also sometimes we sue, you know, other companies or or people on their behalf when that's necessary as well. Uh, In a nutshell, uh, the landscape of which has changed a lot actually in the, over the course of the last year, because a lot of that happens virtually now versus in a courtroom. But, uh, we'll see how that, you know, continues on. Uh, I'm a member of the firm's litigation uh, group, the sports and entertainment group, and the video gaming and esports practice groups. And I represent, as Darius mentioned, corporate clients in those industries, teams, leagues, federations, stadiums, their facilities, clubs, hotels, social media companies, you name it, and a variety of other different clients uh, as well. Today, we're going to be talking about the right of publicity and Electronic Arts' recent announcement that they're going to be bringing back NCAA football. Now, this is interesting because there was a bit of litigation back starting back in 2009 um, between the NCAA and uh, a college basketball player for UCLA named Ed O'Bannon. And the point of that litigation um, was to stop Electronic Arts and the NCAA from using the name image likeness information for college athletes in video games. And as a result of the filing of the complaint in that case, EA stopped Uh, releasing NCAA basketball in 2009, which is when the the case was filed. And in 2014, when there was an appeals court decision in that case in favor um, of the student athletes, 
Uh, EA ultimately abandoned its NCAA football franchise, but now they're talking about bringing it back. They're calling it, they're, they're leaving out the NCAA name now and they're calling it, I think, EA College Football or something like that. Um, Angie, maybe you can talk a little bit about the O'Bannon case and the background of that and how we got to this point of not having college athletes um, in, in our college video games. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see, Darius, uh, what the game is actually named by the time it's released. And I think they, they've they mentioned at some point in 2023 because of the changing landscape of everything that's going on. But, you know, O'Bannon really kind of kicked off uh, this issue where, uh, you know, and, and it's an issue that's been, you know, debated for, for years and years uh, with respect to college athletes and, and amateurism. And what can the conferences, what can NCAA, uh, what can the schools, you know, control, regulate with respect to compensation that these athletes receive, especially in situations, for example, where their name, image, and likeness, or just their, their image and likeness, or sometimes, like in O'Bannon, um, just the likeness is being utilized in a video game that's making, uh, you know, EA Sports uh, a lot of money. <laughs> uh, so, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting case, and I don't want to take, uh, you know, Mike McCann's thunder away, and he's going to get into it with us in a, in a bunch more detail, but O'Bannon was really the case that, that set off this, this national debate about what kind of compensation athletes can receive um, for, for what as they're going through their, their collegiate years uh, playing sports. So uh, right before the trial was scheduled to begin, uh, EA actually settled with O'Bannon uh, for $40 million, which goes to show you how much money, you know, and this is back in 2009, how much money they're actually, you know, making off of these games. Um, but the NCAA proceeded to trial. And in June of 2014, as you mentioned before, the court ruled in favor of O'Bannon against the NCAA and ordered another $40 million in damages uh, to be paid by the NCAA. So, so O'Bannon, you know, got damages $80 million total. Another, a, a number of other class action lawsuits came afterwards and were filed by student athletes against the NCAA and var various uh, colleges followed suit. Uh, and these cases are combined in a single suit heard by the same judge, actually, that heard the O'Bannon case, which is Judge Claudia Wilkin. And Judge Wilkin ruled for the plaintiffs again. Uh, and the Supreme Court recently heard oral argument on the NCAA's appeal, and we are all waiting with bated breath, uh, both, you know, the, not both all the athletes, the schools, the conferences, the NCAA, uh, the video game companies, uh, you know, Congress, the state legislatures, you name it, everyone is waited, waiting on this decision from the Supreme Court, which could come at some point in the summer or even in the fall, depending on, on how long it takes them to get, to get through the analysis to see if it's gonna change the landscape of how this all functions and whether athletes will be in a position to obtain compensation directly from third parties for having their image and likeness used, for example, in a video game. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. The next couple of months are gonna be very exciting from, from you know, our perspective as, as lawyers, um, but also just generally in the sports uh, college world as well. And that, that second case, just for our viewers, is, is called NCA versus Alston. Yes, absolutely. It's the Alston case. Yeah. So. And, and um, you know, one of the, the things that's, uh, that, that I think we need to touch on as well, in case people don't understand this concept, is, is amateurism. The reason why the NCA will not pay athletes uh, or not, will not have them um, receive any kind of compensation for the use of their name, image, likeness, is the concept of, of amateurism. Um, and, and that we don't want our college athletes to be paid to maintain some type of um, pure form of sport in, in college. Um, and, and so that's where, where these things come to a head, right? Right, absolutely. And, and, and listen, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting debate and, and there's a lot of gray in the middle, but the whole point of amateurism is, is to keep that college sports experience pure. Okay. and not have it tainted um, when you have money getting pumped in from a bunch of different you know, uh, funnels and, and influencing the way that the school behaves, the sports program behaves, the way that the athletes you know, behave and function. 
you know, but at the end of the day, the world has changed. Okay? I mean, people get paid for, for, you know, putting something on Twitter. People get paid for, for an Instagram post. Uh, and we're not talking chum change either. You know, we're talking about a lot of money. And the truth of the matter is the majority of these college athletes don't go on to play pro or, you know, aren't engaged in sports that make, you know, huge revenues. Or even if they do go on to the pros, um, they're injured. They don't last long. Things happen. So, you know, is there a way, and I think this is what everybody's struggling right now, is there a way to do both, to retain amateurism, um, but also to the extent that some of these athletes have an ability to negotiate with third parties like EA, for example, on these video gaming deals, is that okay? And can we do that in a way that doesn't affect um, the college experience itself? And, and I think that uh, I'm hopeful, quite frankly, that, that we'll get there. So to me, taking the college players' attributes um, away from the game takes take something away, right? I mean, the reason that I play video games, I think the reason that a lot of people play video games is for the experience of uh, becoming someone else, right? One, one of my biggest thrills on the Sega Genesis was being able to play as Kerry Kittles in Coach K college basketball. I went to Villanova and... I absolutely loved um, uh, Kerry Kittles, and to be able to play as him and the other Villanova players in a game um, was the reason I bought the game. I mean, honestly. Um, so, yeah. you know. It'd be like playing like a WWE game with like anonymous, nondescript wrestlers. What fun right. is that? Right. There is no, yeah, there is no fun to that. So, um, so yeah, I mean, what, what is your thought about that, about, NC, about EA coming out with an NCAA football game potentially in 2023? with randomized um, player avatars and player names. Do you think that that will be successful? So, so it's interesting, Darius. And the reason why these athletes can't accept funds directly from third parties uh, is because then the NCAA would declare that they were ineligible to play. It basically renders them ineligible. And that's a huge problem, obviously, for the athlete, for the school. Uh, it's a huge problem, quite frankly, for the NCAA if, if that's what ends up happening, you know, over and over and over again. You can kind of see the conflict that this would cause. So, uh, you know, part of what's going on now with the NCAA and, and the athletes and the schools and the conferences is they're trying to come up with a creative way of, of solving this problem so it does not result in a situation where you have all of these student athletes who, by the way, already missed a good chunk of time playing because of the pandemic, uh, not being able to play going forward because they're taking compensation, uh, you know, from a company like EA, for example, and then declared ineligible to play. It's it's not a good situation. It's not the kind of situation anybody wants. Right. And if the Supreme Court in Austin ultimately does say that, or side with, side with student athletes, basically, and say that the, the NCAA can't do this, they can't um, say that you can't be paid and also maintain your amateur status, I think that opens up the floodgates for um, not only video game companies, but companies like Nike, apparel companies, beverage companies to come in and, and start paying athletes, um, which could be a problem on the other side, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and at that point, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I hate using this term, but that's what we're dealing with. It becomes kind of the Wild West. And, and listen, at the end of the day, let's be honest, you know, some athletes that are popular are popular because of their social media following, for example, not necessarily because they're great at what they do. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's about what they wear, their personality. And, you know, realistically speaking, are those guys going to make money playing professionally in the future? Probably not, but they've got a following and, and they're popular in, in that arena and that sport. And, and there's, there are many, many companies and people that will pay them, for example, to post something on Twitter, to go ahead and post something on IG or on, you know, Facebook, whatever the case may be and, and get paid for that. So it's, it's a very, very, you know, interesting landscape. And I think that, um, waiting for the Supreme Court, quite frankly, to make a decision, uh, you know, is dangerous. It's dangerous. Yeah, I agree. Now that we've set up some of these topics, I'd like to bring on our special guest, we are really excited to have with us today one of the preeminent experts in the field of sports law. He is the director of the Sports and Entertainment Law Institute at Franklin Pierce Law School. He is an award-winning journalist for Sportico. And most importantly for our purposes here today, he is the co-author with Ed O'Bannon of the book Court Justice, the inside story of my battle with the NCAA. Please welcome Michael McCann. Well, thanks for having me, Darius and Angela. It 
there's so much going on these days that I'm sure we have a lot of things to talk about. Yeah, there really is. Um, and the, one, the first thing I wanted to talk about is the oral argument uh, before the Supreme Court in NCAA versus Alston that happened a couple of months ago. Um, you were listening to that oral argument live. You were live tweeting about it. What were your impressions of the oral argument and some of the things that the justices said? And how do you think that case might ultimately turn out? Yeah, I was struck by how hostile the bench was to the NCAA. I think in a way that nobody really had predicted, particularly given that the, the quote, conservative justices were especially hostile to the NCAA and, and their arguments about amateurism. I thought Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Alito in particular, where they talked about the, the rights of an athlete and the ability of schools to join hands and limit what schools pay those athletes in a way that clearly struck them as, if not unlawful, at least inappropriate. So I, that, that was probably my big takeaway was just the manner in which the hearing proceeded. You might think a conservative justice would be conservative in the sense of let's keep things the way they are. This is the tradition. College sports has a long tradition of of doing things a certain way. And lawyers for the NCAA have really honed in on that, trying to say, let's not unravel everything. We like things the way they are. But the justices were saying, just because you've been doing something for a long time doesn't mean it's right. So what happens, we'll find out, as we all know, how justices appear on a bench isn't always predictive of how they're going to rule in a case. But it would seem as if a majority of the court took a position against the NCAA, at least in the oral argument. So that can't be good news for the NCAA, although I think we, we can talk about how impactful is this case. It's a Supreme Court case, which makes it influential, but the actual remedy isn't quite as sweeping as maybe it's been portrayed by some. Right. And, I, and the, the thing that I found the most interesting about it was um, uh, Justice Alito's comment about, hey, we pay... Um, college coaches, we pay them a lot of money. Why can't we pay athletes? Uh, and I think that was a really good point. Um, and as you said, you never know. Um, there's a lot of things that get uh, said at oral arguments, and then you see the decision, and it's 180 degrees different. Um, but I, I suppose we'll see on that. Um, Angie? Yeah. So, so, Mike, just to give the audience a little background as to how we got to where we are, you were involved uh, in, a, in a very well-known, uh, I would say famous case uh, involving Ed O'Bannon, and you actually wrote a book together about it uh, that was really, you know, kind of pioneered, uh, you know, where we, are, where we are today for the most part. Can you tell us a little bit about that and just explain for the audience the ramifications of that case and how it was to work with with that O'Bannon and, and, and go ahead and write that book Sure. So as you remember, 2009, which seems like forever ago, Ed O'Bannon saw that he was in a video game. By that point, he was retired. He was 36 years old. He's married with three kids, living comfortably in a suburb of Las Vegas. And a buddy of his said, hey, Ed, my son bought this game and you're the star in it. And Ed just thought, well, I, I didn't know I was in a video game. I didn't know I was a star in the game. And then he went to see it. And and over time, Ed sort of thought, it's it's cool, I'm in a game, but you know, there are a lot of people in this game that didn't make the money that he made playing basketball, and some made nothing playing basketball and are in the game, though their names aren't there. Their height, weight, race, skill set are all there, jersey number. And in Discovery, it was later shown that the names had been had been imported and then stripped from the players. So Ed brought a case against the NCAA and Electronic Arts, and long story short, settles with EA, becomes a class action, and players get in the ballpark of $2,000 to $7,000, the ones that were in the game. The NCAA doesn't settle and loses the case, where under antitrust law, O'Bannon was able to show that the NCAA and its members had joined hands to prevent players from monetizing their name, image, and likeness in the context of video games. And the, the reason why I ended up writing a book with, with Ed was I went to his trial. I was there covering it for Sports Illustrated. And while I was there, I had dinner with him. And uh, we, we had a very good meeting. 
And I remember saying to him, I said, hey, when this thing is over, would you speak at my law school? Uh, come to my school first. And of course, I say, have you been to New Hampshire? Most people say no when they're not from New England, right? So you kind of trap them where they have to say yes at that point. And, and he said he's been to Massachusetts, but he's never been to New Hampshire. He said, sure. So he'll come out. After it was decided, he flew out um, and we had a very good time. He spoke at my school. And while there, we talked about a book project and we ended up doing the book Court Justice, which talked about his case. It also talked about his life story, how he was a superstar at UCLA, got injured, but was able to rebound and have an MBA career and also a career abroad. I mean, one of the interesting things that you mentioned is how old was he when his career ended? He was 32, about 32. His knee, he had had multiple knee surgeries and it just wore out. Right. Wore out. And those same antitrust issues, um, I guess, are uh, not, I guess, they are what we're going to be dealing with, uh, what the Supreme Court is, is dealing with right now in the Austin uh, versus NCAA. Yeah, that's correct. it's the same basic basic thing, right? Colleges joining hands through the NCAA to, in some form or another, limit economic opportunities for athletes and provide revenue to schools that the players would argue, at least in part, ought to go to the players, that they should have a right to be part of, of those transactions. And it is the same set of issues. And it's really a fundamental tension for the NCAA. As the NCAA in college sports has made a lot more money over the years with coaches' salaries, as Darius noted, with Justice Alito citing that, I think it just becomes a harder argument for the NCAA to make, law or not. It's just in terms of common sense. People say, why is it that one coach makes $10 million a year, but the players on the coach's team are limited in what they can get to a full ride? It just strikes people as not correct. Right. When we talked about this before, Mike, one of the things that I found really interesting is you mentioned that um, Ed O'Bannon was getting nasty letters. And I think you said even you used the word death threats um, from from gamers um, who were upset that uh, EA pulled NCAA basketball first uh, and then later pulled NCAA football Um and I mean, that that to me, that's just it's completely shocking. But that actually happened, right? Yeah. Every time you see a video game in Ed O'Bannon, there will be hate, whether it be tweets or letters or emails. It, it's amazing in, in a disturbing way how much how intense people are about it as a starting point and b that they're willing to say these things to him. And, and to me now, I mean, I sort of became an extension of that, uh, not nearly the, the sort of hostility that he got, but it also sort of is interesting because it's, it's sort of fundamentally wrong, right? The NCAA could allow video games tomorrow if they let college players be able to license to be in those games, that it's a very easy fix that the NCAA hasn't yet permitted and Ed was blamed for you know, taking the games away when in reality it wasn't him. He was just calling out illegal con conduct, right? Yeah. And he won. He showed that it was illegal. I mean, that's the thing is that he, he got a, a district court and the Ninth Circuit to agree that it's illegal to say, we're going to put you in these video games and not only not pay you, but you have no right to get paid. So, you know, it's interesting when people find it problematic that the game is not there, but... I guess it's easier to blame him than sort of the, the concept of the NCAA and amateurism. That's a, it's a more diffuse thing, but it is interesting. I mean, I was struck by how intense it is. And Mike, I mean, I, this is a little off topic, but for the viewers, it might be interesting and they, and they probably don't really know the answer to this. But the Supreme Court, for example, has this pending decision before it. We're going to get it at some point in the summer or, or the fall, depending on how this goes, you know, a, do we know if any of them are, are gamers? B, um, you know, do you think that they are paying attention to what's going on? You know, announcements being made by the NCAA, like the one this week where they're we're actually considering 
um, you know, allowing this now uh, for the first time. Do you think they're paying attention to what's going on when EA announces that, you know, in 2023 they're going to come out uh, maybe with NCAA, you know, football again or some variation of it, depending on how all this plays out? What's the impact there, if any? Do you I've got to think they're listening, especially given the amount of attention it gets. And also their clerks, right? Their clerks are in most cases, not long out of law school. So they're probably more attuned, I'm guessing, to to those issues than maybe the justices, though some of the justices clearly are following sports. Justice Kavanaugh, we know, is a big sports fan, right? That that was part of his biographical story before he was confirmed by the Senate that he would go to Yale games and, and, and see Washington pro sports teams uh, I, I think there's reason to think that some of the other justices are interested in sports as well. So they, they have to know. And, and some of their questions to me struck me as sort of outside the briefs, especially talking about coaches' salaries and talking about sort of the plight of the college athlete. The briefs really were, as we know, focused more on antitrust law. So it struck me that they're that they're thinking about these things as a judge, but also just as a as an American person, you know, that we're what is the right outcome for not only college sports, but just the way we conduct ourselves in this country? Is it is it correct that college athletes should should be limited in what they can get when our economy is generally much more open? It's it, these are really, I think, fundamental questions that they're trying to think through. And, and Angie, I think that's a good segue into talking about um, the response to Alston and, and right. the, um, some of these issues by the states. I think we have five or six um, different states now that have uh, laws that are potentially going to go into effect on July 1 that are. Yeah, I mean, I'm sitting in Florida and, and, and they're yeah, one of them. And so, so maybe yeah. talk about that. You know, I mean, th these laws are going to give athletes the right to be compensated for use of their name, image and likeness. Um, maybe um, talk about that, Angie, a little bit about your experiences with what's going on in Florida and, you know, uh, how that how that might, um, uh, you know, impact on issues of preemption. Right. I mean, and and it's interesting because now, you know, it, it, the law always takes a while to catch up, um, you know, w w with many things, especially when it comes to. Um, anything having to do with, with tech. Um, and we're specifically talking about, you know, video games here. Uh, because really, that's a massive, you know, revenue driver. These athletes uh, and, and the schools, quite frankly, because not only do they use the, the image and, and likeness of, of the athlete, they're using, in, in many cases, the actual stadium, the venue itself, uh, the team logos. So the schools, the athletes. So it's, it's kind of a race to the finish line now. Uh, between whether at the federal level Congress will pass something that will have nationwide implications or it'll be up to the individual states to go in and, and beat them to it, which they, they clearly already have in many cases, my state being one of them, uh, getting its own NIL, name, image, and likeness law, you know, on the books uh, in about a month or so uh, and, and effective. And then, you know, you have the other issue of the NCAA. Um, what regulations are they going to try and, and implement and pass and, and whether they're going to be able to work with Congress, work with the states so that this all looks uniform? Because to the extent that we have a bunch of varying schemes that are competing with each other at the state level, at the federal level, uh, you know, with the NCAA, uh, it's going to cause it's going to cause issues. It's going to cause problems. And it's, it's one of the reasons I asked Mike the question I asked, because you know, the Supreme Court is in a very interesting position right now because all of this is actively happening as they sit there, you know, thinking about and writing this decision. And we don't know what the landscape is going to look like a month from now, two months from now. Is the NCAA going to double down now and, and you know, issue a bunch of regulations that makes it unnecessary for these other states to act or for Congress to act? We don't know. And at the end of the day, will it all be for naught? What if the Supreme Court comes back on this antitrust decision in the fall uh, and undoes some of what the states and Congress and the NCAA has done? Um, you know, what if they, they say, no, you didn't go far enough? I mean, so it's really going to be a really interesting next couple of months. Yeah. Mike, your, your final thoughts on that. And, and I, I know we talked before about maybe the NCAA going for an injunction. Maybe you can speak to that point, which I think is really interesting. Yeah, and Angie really explained sort of the tension that the NCAA faces by 
not resolving this issue before, they've created a vacuum for others to enter. And a group of states have already done so. Congress, as, uh, as Angela noted, is, is sort of sitting on it right now. We're in the middle of May and it, it, July 1 is coming pretty fast. So it's, I, I'm skeptical that Congress is going to somehow, with everything else going on, that they're going to pass. First of all, nothing's left committee yet. So there's been no floor debate. There have been no hearings. We don't know what President Biden thinks about that. I mean, there's all these sort of big question marks about the, the federal side of it. So one option for the NCAA, if it doesn't want to resolve this before July 1, is to seek injunctions in each of those states. They tried this strategy before and it worked in a different context in the early 90s after Nevada passed a statute. This was in the wake of the UNLV basketball scandal. Nevada passed a statute saying there has to be neutral tribunal for disciplinary proceedings involving college coaches and college players. That, of course, undermined the NCAA's ability to enforce its rule. The NCAA went to court. It sued the governor of, of uh, Nevada, arguing that it's a violation of the contract clause, the Constitution, and the Commerce Clause, basically saying you're interfering with our contracts and you're interfering with the commerce of other states because we can't apply our rules. And there's also the patchwork problem where every state has their own rules, so we can't create a national standard. And they won. I mean, this is the interesting thing is that the NCAA could try that here. Now, it's different here because this is the relationship between the athlete and the third party, the apparel company, the sneaker company. But it wouldn't shock me if the NCAA tries that, especially if they don't want to see July 1 come and and athletes in Florida, Georgia, Alabama, et cetera, are, are signing endorsement deals, whereas those in other states can't. Right. And, and I happen to know that right before the pandemic, you know, kind of shut everybody down, uh, the NCAA had just started giving the exam and licensing agents that could represent um, student athletes, uh, you know, special training, special testing just for that purpose. And it seemed like they were they were gearing up potentially for something like this where they could put some, you know, kind of plan in place and then, um, you know, make sure that these student athletes were, were represented and, and the deals were being negotiated by these um, agents that were specifically licensed for this purpose um, to take any of the concerns everyone has, I guess, into account. So, um, you know, I guess, uh, you know, the pandemic put a, put a halt on all of this, but it does seem as though if they wanted to, there, there are mechanisms in place and there's no reason why they can't make that test available again and, and get more agents on board to help with these negotiations. Yeah, right? and, and I know that in January they punted on NIL at a concern that there would be antitrust scrutiny of their rules. But the counter argument is, so what if there's antitrust scrutiny? I mean, if, if it's a reasonable rule, it will withstand antitrust scrutiny. And by not coming up with anything, it has allowed states to sort of fill the void in a way that it creates all sorts of administrative problems for the NCAA to have a national set of rules. So you're right. They they were thinking about regulating agents. Now, whether that's you know good or bad could certainly be debated. But uh, it is interesting that they've sort of thought it through before, and now it seems like they've they're they're holding holding themselves out for an outcome that is pretty unpredictable right now. These, these issues are extremely interesting, and I think we could probably sit here and talk for another hour about all of this stuff, but uh, we have to let Mike go. Uh, Mike, thanks so much for coming on. This has been a fantastic discussion. We really appreciate your time and your insight. Um, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Mike. It's always great talking Bye -bye. to you. So as you'll probably have noticed, the bulk of this episode was recorded before the Supreme Court decision in NCAA versus Alston. That decision came out today, June 21st. And surprisingly, it didn't do anything to resolve the name, image, likeness rights issue for college athletes that we've been talking about here today. The Supreme Court effectively punted on that issue um, through a procedural uh, loophole. Let's call it that. So, Angie, uh, what are your, your initial impressions uh, of the decision? 
So it's interesting. Leave it to the, the lawyers to find the loophole in something. Uh, classic. Uh, so the decision is, is very interesting. And basically what they did was they upheld you know, the lower court, the Ninth Circuit, and talked about uh, educational benefits and how that is essentially a, a violation of antitrust law. Now, the interesting thing is, as, as you mentioned, Darius, they completely sidestepped the issue of name, image, and likeness, but all the while sending a very clear unanimous message um, from the Supreme Court um, really to the NCAA. And, and you can clearly see from, from you know, the, the commentary and the decision, especially when it comes to Justice Kavanaugh, that the Supreme Court has a real issue with the way that the, the NCAA's business model is set up. Um, they really only um, discuss the educational benefit com you know, components of, of the case and, and really just kind of ignored uh, all of those other issues. And um, they were well within their right to do that. But I think the message is clear, which is you know, everyone needs to sit at a table and, and figure this out. M moreover, um, the decision really doesn't do anything to stop the various states that have either laws that are ready to go into effect on July 1st or in the process of drafting laws that are going to go into effect at some point this year or sometime soon with respect to name, image, and likeness. So, you know, we are going to be dealing with, it appears, a situation where, you know, every single state potentially is going to have its own name, image, and likeness law at the very least for the time being and everyone, the schools, the conferences, and the NCAA are going to have to contend with that. Yeah. And the things that jumped out at me were that the Supreme Court said anything that's related to athletics, we're going to let the NCAA govern that. But anything that's unrelated, and they specifically, I wrote this down, they specifically talked about things like scholarships for uh, graduate and vocational school, tutoring and internships. They said those things were okay um, for the NCAA to uh, promulgate rules for student athletes to be paid. Things outside of that scope, like name, image, likeness rights, they left open, but they said, we're gonna judge any rules that you make and any rules that go to litigation on a rule of reason. And Judge Kavanaugh, which I thought was really interesting, had a concurrence and he said, the NCAA is not above the law. And so if, th if something comes back and, and they don't like it, um, it's absolutely going to get thrown out. Yeah, and I think I think it's probably more than that. I think they're sending a very clear message that it shouldn't come back <laughs> uh, because because this is the way we're going to come down every time. So absolutely. Well, hopefully it doesn't come back. Hopefully the NCAA um, and student athletes get together and they figure out something, some kind of solution for this, so that student athletes can be paid uh, and things can move on. Uh, but it'll be very interesting to see what happens on July 1st when some of these state laws potentially go into effect. Well, that's all the time that we have for today. We really hope you've enjoyed this discussion. If you have any questions about any of the legal issues we raised today, please drop them into the comments and we'll try to answer them without providing any actual legal advice, of course. Until next time, I'm Darius, this is Angie, and we are Lawyers with Game. See you next time.